Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and Conscious Resistance website. Um, so today we have Andrew Demeter, who is a truth teller, truth seeker, investigative journalist, and founder of Teen Take, um, his YouTube channel, uh, where he posts some awesome videos on various subjects pertaining to liberty. So, oh, by the way, um, I, I don't have my uh, video, which which really sucks, <laughs> but we'll have to deal with it. <laughs> so, uh, Andrew, so tell us a little bit about how you started off on this path to, uh, you know, searching for answers. Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for having me on. Um, but as far as how I got started, um, the the real first recollection I have of sort of you know following this path of liberty was a while ago, about two years, maybe three years even now back. It was during the summer. I was at a friend's house and we were just going through YouTube like any you know teenagers do on a on a summer day when it's nice outside and we're inside on the computer. And uh, we were searching and somehow we stumbled across a Jesse Ventura video of uh, his old show Conspiracy Theory on True TV. And so we were watching it. It was the episode specifically about the Denver airport and that really sort of led me on this path of questioning you know what are these all these weird symbols here in this place and why are all these political high-profile figures buying property out near Denver and why is there supposedly this underground bunker this doomsday bunker and underground city under the airport so a lot of this as well as you know Illuminati symbolism whether or not that's you know factual or substantiated but all these sort of different uh, ways to question you know reality and and daily life that I hadn't previously done otherwise uh, sort of led me on that path and then also I had a, an experience sort of if you can call you know uh, uh, taking around a, a handheld video camera of your dad's at at uh, holidays and interviewing family members and sort of editing some of that um, on a computer. So I had sort of some of the video experience of editing and video making, and then also the uh, this new path that I sort of uh, started to follow. Cool, nice, and so. So it was a slow progression, starting with your father's video camera and now <laughs> to editing awesome content. I, I mean, I, I watched a couple of your videos and, you know, I can really tell the amount of effort that you put into it. it. You know, even, you know, it's just short videos, but like very good quality, you know, it's something that I strive to make in my myself, you know. <laughs> yeah, quality over quantity. Yeah, definitely. And, and of course, I think the Nancy Pelosi video, like one of your most, I guess, that's what you're known for, is, would you say that? Yeah, I I would say that's accurate. <laughs> so yeah, can you explain that, like how that happened and what you said and and, and everything? Because I think that's a great story. I think it would take me about a full you know hour long segment of the show to explain the whole backstory and everything. But a basic synopsis of it was uh, C-SPAN. Uh, one of my teachers at school she uh, notified me of this contest that C-SPAN annually hosts. It's called Student Cam. Basically, it's for middle and high school students to create a documentary, which is really like a mini documentary. It's only uh, five to seven minutes, I believe, uh, discussing any sort of relevant political, social issue, etc., that has political implications. And uh, I decided to make that film about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and I called it We the People Genetically Modified. Long story short, I was one of the top three winners in that contest. C-SPAN flew us all out to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, at the C-SPAN Bureau in Washington, and then uh, on the last day of the trip while we were there, we got to meet with uh, Nancy Pelosi, of course, and I had the question in mind ahead of time about the NSA and her, you know, basic flip-flopping dependent on what political party holds uh, power in Washington, and I just wanted to call her out on that, you know, uh, because I figured, you know, when am I going to get another opportunity like this to, you know, point blank uh, fire a question at these at this politician and. Uh, and you know, I'm glad that it, it sent shockwaves. It got like a quarter of a million views on YouTube, and m my hope is that you know it gets people thinking that politicians they can be hypocritical, and not only that, but they're so vulnerable. Um, really, they're they're humans too. We think of them as these you know superhuman uh, you know characters. When in reality, you can just ask them a question, and you can tell that they're easily lying. 
um, because you know just judging by their uh, hand gestures and, and and fumbling of words and everything um, so that was basically that confrontation it was also funny because in, in the video itself you can see there's two different angles one of me holding up my cell phone at the beginning and then a second one of a c-span cameraman there who was filming the event and basically after the whole thing happened uh, we were walking outside and one of C-SPAN's employees uh, said you know I, I know I saw you filming uh, this sort of confrontation are you planning it on planning on posting it to YouTube and I said um, you know why does it matter to you <laughs> and he said and to paraphrase he basically said uh, well we wouldn't want to damage our relationship with Pelosi's office so I found that really revealing as well C-SPAN you know touts itself as, as being unbiased and then you know they don't want to hurt their political ties with with a particular leader and so then eventually too my cell phone video half of that video actually didn't record the second half of it too didn't record because I ran out of memory on my phone you know just my luck mm -hmm. uh, so then I had to try to wrangle with C-SPAN basically to get back the footage because they said they wouldn't send it to me uh, they had an agreement that they couldn't uh, record audio in in the building we were in in the Capitol um, and and I found that kind of funny too and I have picture proof of it because they had this you know shotgun mic on the camera they were using to record so you know it was a completely facile and uh, fake argument Wow. Yeah, uh, I think uh, a lot of people who are driven to, you know, seeking uh, the hidden truths of, of reality come to terms with the, uh, the hypocrisy and lies of politicians. Um, and that's, you know, that's definitely what, what you know, also kind of got me realizing this too. And, and, then, and, then, and then you begin to wonder, like, like anyway, I did, like, is there, is there a possibility for a politician to do good like are all politicians can you say categorically evil and wicked or is it that they have good intentions but but that the um how do you say the unintended consequences uh just reverberate and they cause damage unintentionally you know what, what do you what do you think about that well, you know, to begin with, just on a philosophical level, I guess, I don't think that it's good to ever, you know, stereotype a whole a whole group of people and label them. Um, you know, not, in my opinion, not all cops are bad. And as you said, uh, with politicians going into office, I don't think it's right to stereotype them all as, you know, nefarious. Um, I think that there's a good portion of them that probably go into office or go campaigning with, um, I wouldn't say nefarious, but just self-interested um, ideals and and you know how they can basically profit themselves at the expense of the people and then I think there are some people uh, genuinely out there who try to go into office for change but then as you said um, their their uh, goals get mutated and and it becomes this sort of egotistical uh, trip and uh, they just basically get corrupted yeah yeah and uh, you know with myself you know in my my journey to to volunteerism and you know uh, learning about um, you know Austrian economics and learning about the nature of government. So um, yeah, so public schools, right? Take public schools. I mean, um, you know, you know, you can say that that uh, you know some people would come to the conclusion that you know it's just about indoctrination and propaganda and everything, and that the teachers are evil and wicked and and just trying to um, you know uh, you know mentally enslave the kids, but. I, I think that uh, perhaps it's not the teacher's fault, although they do work there. Um, they, they, I think, for the most part, are kind-hearted, try to teach the kids, try to, you know, trying to educate the kids. Um, I think the problem is the structure and, and, and how much it hinders their flexibility, right, and how, how rigid the curriculum is, which, which to me is a, is a reflection of of the government involvement in any sector of the society, you know, you take any se sector, and you know that's what you get because you know when it becomes controlled by the government, it basically becomes a monopoly, loses all accountability, um, and loses its um, its how you say um, the drive to excel, to improve that any you know private business would have, right? So, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um 
You know, it's just it's just really unfortunate. It seems like like you said, you know, these these teachers are, are, are victimized almost. You know, some people would look at them and say, you know, oh, you know, the teachers are supposed to be, you know, responsible for, you know, not only teaching these kids, but also making them want to learn. And like you said, I think the fundamental problem is this government control um, because uh, you know, for example, the, the standards of education um, are basically control. Well, the, the standards of education are controlled by the state. Um, and instead of, you know, fundamentally evaluating the curriculum, for example, and saying, you know, oh, maybe we no longer need to teach um, this, you know, very complex form of math, for example, because, well, calculators, technology has innovated to the point where, you know, it can basically do it for us. Um, so instead of, you know, evaluating curriculum on, you know, a, a basis of relevancy, um, it's basically just evaluated to see, you know, evaluated by these politicians who really aren't the people in school. And they say, oh, well, you know, let's not evaluate it so it's better. Let's just sort of tweak the statistics. So, for example, our, you know, educational standards appear higher than that of, you know, the next country. And, you know, another thing that sort of is related to this that I find funny is, you know, Obama's whole free college proposal, sort of like the Federal Reserve printing more money. People are like, ooh, free money. But in reality, uh, it's inflation and people don't really understand these very complex concepts, uh, even though, you know, free college would seem to be a simple com uh, concept that, you know, taxpayer money is actually funding free college and, and it's not free. Um, so, you know, those are sort of just some of my thoughts, if that helps. Yeah. You know, I, I forgot to ask you, I usually ask this in the beginning, but what, um, you know, what books or, or podcasts or online personalities have influenced you the most? You know, other than you mentioned um, uh, Ventura. Jesse right? Ventura. Yeah, Jesse Ventura. Mm -hmm. Other than him, any other like books or articles or, you know, um, shows that, that really influenced you? Books I should be uh, reading more of, really, but uh, it's not too political of a book, really, but I recently just read uh, a book called The Food Babe Way by uh, Vani Hari. She's all about food activism and everything and, and food transparency, which to me, I think, is one of the most important issues. Um, you know, it has a little bit less to do with politics, but it's still very much so influenced by uh, politics and this conflict of interest and the corporatocracy, of course, of these corporations basically um, controlling everything in our food supply, and, and, it's, and it's pretty frightening um, the amount of intimacy they have with government. So that's one book that I've read. As far as other shows, um, we were mentioning Anarchast. Since I was a guest on uh, Jeff's show, I have uh, watched some more of his you know conversations with people, and, and those are very enlightening. Otherwise, uh, I occasionally watch RT. One of my favorite shows was uh, Breaking the Set. Unfortunately, Abby Barton um, is no longer... Uh, producing that show, I've I've sent her a couple emails to try to interview her, and hopefully I will be doing so uh, in the next month or so. But um, so those are sort of some of my inspirations. Um, and like I said, I should be reading more books. <laughs> yeah, um, th actually, I did see the um, the Fran Drescher video that you made. That was that was really amazing. How, how did you get her on? By the way. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, you know, I wish I could tell a tall tale like a politician and make it sound more interesting than it actually was <laughs> and make it sound like I had some, you know, secretive insider tactics or a special connection to Fran. Um, but in reality, I just saw a couple, I interviewed her like a month and a half ago or something. And uh, in December or so, I think it was around there, she was uh, doing some Indiegogo fundraiser online for her, for her organization, uh, Freudian slip. No, just kidding. Um, anyway, she was <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, she was doing this uh, online fundraiser, a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding project for her organization called Cancer Schmancer, which is about uh, mitigating cancer. One of the subtopics of that being uh, food, of course, genetically modified organisms. You know whether or not there's the relation, um, but. So long story short, I donated X amount of dollars to that uh, campaign and myself and about seven other people or five other people were in a Skype call with her and we got to ask her one question. Um, so I just wanted to take advantage of that. And I didn't even tell her that I was recording actually, but um, her assistant actually did see the video and uh, wants me to be sort of uh, a youthful voice of uh, the organization. So um, that's, that's an interesting opportunity as well. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, you know, 
my um you know my path into this uh field you know volunteerism i um i started out very interested in nutrition um you know holistic nutrition and um juicing and you know alternative cancer therapies that was really my fascination when i was a teenager and uh, and i and i'm i'm an acupuncturist and chinese herbalist and eastern nutritionist uh so i studied that myself and then you know i did an additional reading and research after that um so that's really what got me into you know learning about the whole gmo uh, topics and about vaccinations, which is really big into the news right now, um, and you know, you know, learning about Monsanto and Dupont and Syngenta and all that, and um, and then I, you know, I got to realizing, like, you know, a lot of people, you know, they vilify these these enormous mega corporations, you know, and rightly so, but um, but then again, you know, the problem, like a lot of them say, you know, it's all. For the bottom line, you know, they all say it's all for the bottom line. They only care about, they don't care about human life, quality of life. You know, it's just all for the bottom line. But in essence, it's not really profits, I think, that's evil, right? Because, you know, you know, the core, the, the uh, you know, the local family uh, uh, small mom and pop shop, they're, they're trying to make a profit, right? <laughs> you know, they're trying, they're going for their bottom line, right? But um, I think what, what really people... Um, they don't really make the connection, you know, especially those Wall Street, you know, the, what do you call it, Occupy Wall Street, right? Like they're, you know, they're going after, you know, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America and, you know, all the big uh, uh, banks, which is good and all. But then you have to you have to ask the question, what is giving these corporations power, right? Absolutely. Because, because in the end, we're not forced to buy their products. Like, you know, you can do your research on GMOs. You can find out what, what foods are GMOs and you cannot eat them. You, you cannot buy that, right? And, and so in the end, if people do, uh, you know, learn about it, do a boycott, they can survive, you know? So what are your, what exactly. are your thoughts on that? I think that uh, you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, these corporations, of course, not to, you know, undermine or discount the, uh, the you know, nefarious nature of them. Um, because I do think, you know, some companies, uh, the profit is, you know, a legitimate, well, I, th I guess there's a difference too, that we should establish between, you know, striving for profit, which is basically the whole essence of establishing a business. And then this, you know, as Fran Drescher called it in the interview, this insatiable desire for, um, profit. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think capitalism is the problem. I think the problem is, um, government, like I said, with Monsanto getting so intimate with these corporations and establishing this, you know, joint government corporate um you know uh you know monopoly if you will and like you said too in a free market this wouldn't happen because if people didn't like monsanto um you know they'd go out of business as as they should if uh, a company is you know producing things uh nefariously so i i think that's absolutely the case and um, you know, like you said, at the bottom of the uh, or at the end of the day, it all comes down to the power of the dollar. And you know, that's obviously a whole a whole other thing that we could go into. You know, the Federal Reserve and and uh, money and how that works. So basically, I agree. I I don't think corporations are necessarily evil. I think the role government has in you know giving them a sort of uh, judicial immunity like they do with Monsanto or this sort of monopolistic precedent, I think that is uh, more concerning. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, um, yeah, because in the end, they're just corporations, I mean, they're just businesses and they still rely on your patronage, right? And and if, if that's so, then I, I can't really see how you can blame them. Like, like you know, you can you can learn about McDonald's, and you know, you watch uh, what's it called, the um, Super Size Me, right? Super Size Me. You know, you learn about yeah. how e evil it is. And I mean, I don't eat at McDonald's, but 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 um, you know, some people do. So they're in business, you know. Um, and and if if McDonald's gets big because a lot of people buy their products, like I don't have a problem with that because they're not using any coercion or violence to force people to buy their products, right? But it's kind of funny, like like me being a volunteerist when I. When I mentioned stateless societies and like, and like, um, what do you think would happen if you know there was there was no government? And one of the one of the main uh, complaints that I hear is that you know you know corporations or or I guess I guess just big businesses would would gather together, collude, and just like maybe they they'll militarize. You know, you know what? I I don't know if you saw my one of my recent um, debates I had with a friend. Uh, one of his complaints. This is this is like true. He said McDonald's. What's to stop McDonald's from buying tanks and weapons 
and forcing you to buy its products. <laughs> I mean, that, that's basically what uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, is, no? Um, yeah, but, is. but like you said, I, I would argue sort of on your point um, that corporations, you know, that we have the free choice to choose them or not. Um, to some extent, I do agree. And, you know, I think we, we obviously still have the free choice to choose them. But like I said, this, this intimacy between government and private industry, uh, like I said, with Monsanto specifically, um, Obama in 2013, it might have been. I'm not sure. I'm not good with dates. Um, but uh, he signed into law the uh, Farmers Assurance Provision, which, which literally gives Monsanto judicial immunity. So I think that's, you know, you said using coercion and everything. I think that is sort of a case of using coercion that they're not responsible like a business should be for, you know, the, the effects of its products and, uh, you know, being ethical. No, you know, you're exactly right. And, and I'm not defending Monsanto in, in the slightest <laughs> at all because they are a special interest group and they are, um, you know, um, catering to the monopoly on violence, which is government, for um, sovereign immunity or protection, right? Like like you said, I think it's um, the, the Monsanto Protection Act, I think it's called, right? Like buried into the farmer's bill, like where, mm -hmm. where if, the, if a person is injured by, by a GMO, um, that um, they can't be sued, right? I, I think. But I think, they guarantee you the products are safe. But they guarantee, yeah, <laughs> all natural. And they don't want to. And they don't want to label it either, right? Um, exactly. And, but they're uh, so proud of their science. They they go to the extent of patenting it. They're so proud. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's uh, you know it's definitely steeped in a lot of hypocrisy and contradictions. Um, but um, but yeah, you know I'm, I I talk a lot about you know the free market again and 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 um, you know just. When you give businesses um, freedom to to practice or to um, you know to run their business the way they want, to hire whomever they want, to pay them whomever they want, you know you know you do away with minimum wage laws. Um, I I really can't see how how there will be you know enormous results in prosperity as a result of that. Like like you know we we look out into the economy and I mean I mean who looks out into the economy? You know, a bunch of people just trading. That's basically what you know the economy is. Just a bunch of people just trading back and forth spontaneously, right? There's no like, there's no like central authority saying you know you have to buy from this person. No, we you know we we choose who we buy stuff from, right? It's fundamentally or so we would hope. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, it's anarchic. You know, we you know we have no central authority choosing for us. You know, we have we still have that choice, um, and so and so I think um, that. It, 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 it should always follow that when people make voluntary choices that, uh, you know, there will be prosperity. Like, how can you think that if you take that, that equation and you involve violence and, you know, putting guns to the heads of employers and entrepreneurs, how that would have beneficial and productive results or, or increase their productivity? Like, how can, how can, I don't understand how people can think that. Have yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy and it reminds me of, a story that I recently covered as well in Colorado, I believe it was, there was a bakery there and basically this customer uh, ordered or wanted to order a cake there that said on it, God hates gays uh, in icing. And he, he wanted to order that cake and the and the bakery owner, she said, you know, this, this defies my uh, religious beliefs, I'm not going to do that. And basically this guy, because, you know, he didn't get his way, uh, you know, typical of someone who, you know, likes government or uses it to defend itself, uh, he went to some division of civil liberties or something, which is sort of ironic, and he said he, he tried to file some lawsuit or something, and I don't know if it's still ongoing or, or if it failed or what, but it's just ridiculous, you know, like you said, you know, uh, exchange should be voluntary, we should be able to associate an exchange with who uh, we choose, not having to, you know, be forced to serve uh, a customer, it's, it's absurd. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's a very good example. Like, um, and I think a lot of people, um, a lot of my families included, which uh, which uh, a lot of my family is uh, considered Democrat. Um, and and if you if, if I were to tell that situation, like like could a could a restaurant, um, if they wanted to, only cater to white people? You know what's wrong with that? And they say no, that's horrible. That's immoral. That should be illegal. You know, but but again, in the end, if you think about it, who is really being hurt in the end is it really the black people or is it really the entrepreneur i mean the, exactly. the, the employer because he's he's immediately 
uh, cutting out a portion of society that could be his patrons, right? <laughs> so exactly. In the end, that's, it's hurting him. <laughs> that's the point that I made in the video too. The the businesses, the companies that tolerate the most people will make the most profit. And uh, again, going back to you know the definition of business, the goal is to create profit. So ultimately, it's hurting hurting the business. Now you know it, it's it's sort of like a fine line, I guess, because people say you know oh discrimination. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, again, it's, it's hurting the, the business people. So, uh, you know, that's the business person's choice, not to say I agree or disagree with that. Um, but at the end of the day, the person should have the choice to, you know, choose who they do or do not want to serve. Yeah. Yeah. Just like we, we say, you know, the customer has, has the option to where they want to buy. So that the business owner should have the option whether he wants to, you know, um, take on that customer, right? Uh, and, it, and it kind of reminds me of uh, when people say that you know women are discriminated against because you know most of the of the top CEO positions are men, right? <laughs> and so and so it leaves me wondering. And also also they say that women are paid like what like uh, a quarter less than men on average, something like that. Um, and so if you think about it, like if that's true, if women are indeed paid much less um, and they're equally competent as men, you know, in in those fields. Why isn't th why isn't it then that that these businesses would want to hire these women in mass and pay them that much less to save money? Right? <laughs> like like if 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 they're really the same you know at the same competence and intelligence level. So I mean I mean it's not to say women are stupid. I'm just saying that that uh, you know different people have different inclinations to work. Like 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 <laughs> I don't hear the, the I don't hear the feminists complaining. There's not enough women in the construction in the construction field. There's not enough women garbage you know garbage women. There's not enough you know there's not enough you know you know working in the sewage <laughs> factories. <laughs> And I think I think it would be fair to say also that uh, you know if if they don't like what they're being paid, uh, they're free to leave that job too. You know they're not being forced to stay there. Now, of course, that's not to say you know they they might be dependent on that, of course, for an income to you know live their life. But um, there is also that freedom associated with it of voluntary uh, association. Yeah, 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 definitely. Like. Uh... That's um, you know that that reminds me of some of the Marxists uh, and you know the, the the communists slash socialists who who you know think that the uh, you know the employer is exploiting the uh, the cat you know the evil evil capitalist pig exploiting the worker for their own selfish gains um, and uh, you know paying them slave wages and you know things like that but uh, but again like you said it's it's a completely voluntary contract nobody forced. The person to work there, right? They have options where they want to work, right? You know, there's so many different things. You know, you can, you know, reduce the standard of your living, the cost of your living. You can, you can, you know, improve your skill set, get, get, you know, get a different job, open your own business, right? So you have many different options, and so there is no force whatsoever keeping you there. So if you really don't like it, then you are free to leave. It is completely voluntary contract, right? <laughs> Yeah, except, you know, I think we're assuming, too, when we're saying this, you know, all, all this stuff about freedom, I think that's, you know, assuming that government isn't involved, of course, because of, you know, in most cases, if not all, when they do become involved, excuse me, um, then it becomes, you know, an issue of, uh, of you know, you know, intervention and, and going against the free market, which, you know, is our natural inclination. Yeah, yeah, like talking about the Federal Reserve, like you said, um, you know, a lot of people... Just because you know that's all they know, that's all they know is the Federal Reserve controlling the the, the, the money system, the monetary system. Um, you know they they don't they can't imagine any other way. I think that's the um, that's the appeal to antiquity, logical fallacy. You know if it has been, it it must always be right. <laughs> and 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 so people and, and then I tell people like, what is the um, the goal of the of the Federal Reserve? Like, what's its mission statement? You know, so their mission statement is to preserve the value. Of the U.S. dollar, right? So, <laughs> so I think they've sort of failed at that goal. Yeah, ninety-eight percent destroyed, right? At least, <laughs> like, how good is that? <laughs> yeah, it's it's absurd. And uh, you know, going back to tradition, that's also you know a common thread that I notice. You know, oh, this is the way it's it's always been, so we must keep it that way. You know, except for the people who uh, voted for change with uh, Obama, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy that people just can't think outside this, you know, predetermined box of of thought that they're really born into, you know, geographically and and in every other way. And uh, you know, this is why 
things like books and the internet are just so empowering because like we mentioned earlier, these things are decentralized. Well, at least in the case of internet, not really books. Um, but, uh, you know, these things or the internet's so decentralized, it allows all these different points of views and, uh, it's just so enlightening and, uh, empowering. So, all right. So, so before we sign off, um, let me just ask you real quick, uh, um, about your your views on like homeschooling and unschooling, and and if you know of any 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 kids that have been homeschooled or unschooled, and and if if I don't think you've done a video on that, right? Uh, I actually have. It was uh, a while ago. Okay. I I honestly I'm a little rusty on like some of the talking points that I used in the video, um, but basically uh, I think it's it's a great idea. You know, if if parents have the time and, and are able, I think it's. Uh, a great way to go about. Obviously, I have no personal experience with it, um, but you know, I don't see why why anyone wouldn't. You can you know stray away from what the state wants to teach you and and all this state curriculum and actually you know learn what you're interested in. And I think that's really uh, all that we retain in life. We don't retain you know these mathematical formulas and and uh, you know all these diagrams and history books unless we're passionate about it. Of course, that's the caveat. You know, you you retain and learn, or you should learn what you're passionate about because. Because that's all that you end up retaining, um, because you know you hold it with a, a certain uh, uh, precedence, for lack of a better word, or a certain you know importance to it, and and you make a personal connection with it. So I think that's more important than sort of just uni unilaterally you know jamming all these arbitrary facts seemingly into uh, students' brains, and you know so they can pass a certain test and you know advance to the next uh, echelon of schooling, and then. Uh, just continue down, you know, probably go into debt and become, you know, continue to work your way back up uh, until death, basically, <laughs> to end on a positive note. <laughs> yeah, like, real quick, let me just say my, my kids are four and a half and two and a half year olds. And, and um, you know, I'm definitely going to, you know, do the unschooling or homeschooling, more, more, more akin to unschooling, probably. And I get the common uh, critique of people saying, um, but how are they going to learn math, history, science, you know? Um, if they don't go to school, how are they going to learn that? I'm like, they're going to learn what they're interested in learning, right? And that's what's important. Like, if you were forced to learn something, can you really call that education, you know? Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> is that more akin to indoctrination, right? And regurgitation. Exactly. Regurgitation of and, facts. Uh one one of the arguments too that I used in that video that I did on homeschooling was uh, was you know if you and I read it in a book I don't claim to you know have the original idea or anything but uh, in this one book I read I believe it was like a compilation a compilation of essays on voluntarism and it was like something about parenting too uh, you could find the book on Amazon if that helps but anyway um, one of the arguments used in that was you know if you miss the day of preschool in which you learn how to count from you know one to ten or learn all the colors or or uh, letters of the alphabet or something you know are you never going to learn that if you learn uh, the color of, if you learn on that day that the color of the sky is blue you know <laughs> and if you miss that day are you just never going to learn that you know it, it's crazy we learn so much from instinct too and uh, language is a great example you know nobody forces into our heads um, language we as children and learn and assimilate to language because of our curiosity. You know, we want to learn. We want to communicate with others. And uh, you know, again, nobody forces it into our heads. Instead, we we learn naturally because that's what we're born into, and we're curious and everything. And then, lastly, too, um, I hear a lot. You know, again, this isn't speaking from really experience with homeschooling, but people will say a lot too. You know, oh, if if you homeschool your kids, you know, um, they'll, they'll be socially inept and, and they'll have no social skills. To which I say. I am the counter example because I am in, you know, regular school like and I'm pretty much still socially inept. So <laughs> so uh, that's my that's my uh, parry to that argument. <laughs> yeah, I, I was kind of shy and quiet also. Uh, I didn't really uh care to, you know, make all that many friends. I was I was like more into um, you know, studying um astronomy and theoretical physics, cosmology and eastern philosophy, western philosophy. So uh, oh yeah, and I also started the chess club from ninth grade to 12th grade so there you go so I, was, I was i was the popular you know jock kid you know <laughs> just like me <laughs> yeah um but awesome so um let why don't you let people know where they can find your work 
Sure. YouTube.com slash Team Take, T-E-E-N-T-A-K-E is probably the best place to go. Um, other, than that, other than that, I'm also on Facebook, Andrew Demeter, D-E-M-E-T-E-R. And basically, I don't use any other social media, so YouTube and Facebook are probably your best bets. So you're not a, not a Twitter guy? Uh, I have one. It's it's uh, slash Demeter Andrew, but uh, I don't really tweet too much. So, uh, but you know, if you feel so inclined, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I never really got into Twitter myself either. I just uh, I don't know. Just um, I mean, I guess it's useful, but I don't know. Just some things that you know I can't <laughs> I can't get a hang it, of. It's for all the trendy kids, is it? Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Um, but awesome, uh, Andrew. Thank you very much for the conversation. Um, Thank you. So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care.